Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm very pleased to have two guests today on the stream. We have Megan Vossler, who is an assistant professor of art at McAllister College. And we have Jason Terry, who's a professor of art at Northland College. And what we're gonna be talking about today is the transition to remote teaching that teachers everywhere have been trying to adjust to. So Jason and Megan are gonna to describe to us their experience so we can have a discussion about that. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Now, Megan, last spring was a very abrupt shutdown. Nobody knew what was happening. I think a lot of us were in shock. What was that like for you in the spring when all the schools went online? It was really challenging. Um, it did seem to happen very abruptly. It happened right after our spring break. Um, so I had a little bit of a just a hunch that it might happen. And I asked my students to bring home as or bring with them um, their sketchbooks and like their more portable materials, which turned out to be a really good choice. Um, but it was hard. I mean, we, I, I guess the good thing about it is that we had already had seven weeks or so to get to know each other. So there was a pretty strong sense of community in, in both classes I was teaching at that time. But maintaining that um, without like a really solid method in place was hard. And Jason, what was that like for you, that transition in the spring? Uh, it, it, uh, it was also, you know, very challenging and difficult. Uh, I, I wasn't, we weren't quite as lucky. I think uh, uh, I wasn't able to tell the students to get their supplies um, and uh, fully mo over half of them didn't take their supplies home with them when, so I having to recreate projects, uh, uh, that they could do with whatever they might have around the house was was one of the biggest challenges, I think. I think the lack of art supplies as art professors is just the most heartbreaking part of the situation because really you can only assume students have paper and pencil when they're at home, there aren't a lot of options. And I know that right now, so many teachers, understandably so, are miserable, they're stressed out, they're extremely frustrated, and I think one of the biggest issues here is really the lack of information and training that teachers really need to teach remotely. So Megan, does your school have a learning management system that faculty are given? Do you get faculty training? What type of support have you gotten in that way? Yeah, um, so my school uses Moodle, which is um, you know a pretty, a decent, management system that has a lot of features, but um, those features can be a little hard to access and kind of clunky. Our IT department is amazing and they've done a ton of training, but um, for me personally, I just knew that that wasn't what I wanted to use. Um, and I, I didn't want to, I asked around and nobody had really used OBS, but, and I didn't want to kind of put that on the IT department to, to just help me figure it out. So that's where I turned to Art Prof for help. Um, I, think, I think that it's a lot for an IT department to provide training in ways that are gonna work for every possible type of class on a college campus. Yeah, and on top of that, a lot of schools have major restrictions in terms of what teachers can and cannot use. I did faculty training for a school that said to me, the students may not use YouTube, they're not allowed to meet with teachers one-on-one, -on -one, and you can only assume that the teachers have a phone. And I thought, why are we even here? I mean, who's supposed to work with that? It's just impossible. Now, Jason, does your school, are they providing ongoing training? Did you get training all at once? How did that work at your school? There's been, uh, it's kind of sporadic. We've, we've received a lot of uh, canned videos that we can watch that would help us with our uh, specific uh, course management system, which is Genzabar. Um, and it had, it's, it, it's feature rich, but they are extremely clunky and hard to get at. Um, and we do have um, a staff person who can 
help us uh, if we have questions about how it works. Um, um, but we uh, uh, we haven't received a lot of training uh, specifically on online education. Um, we did get a consultant come in and do a big Zoom meeting with anybody who wanted to come, but that was literally a week before classes started. So it was, if you didn't have it together by then, I don't know how you were gonna do that in a week. Yeah, and I think another issue for a lot of teachers is that they don't really know where to get the information for studio art because sometimes schools just assume, oh, you're teaching a math class, you're teaching history, and a lot of the information is typed and it's very straightforward. It's, I'm not saying it's not different than in person, but the shift is not as dramatic. But we are doing hands-on demos and you can't do that with just screen share. You need to have many more features. And so that, as our teachers, really isolates us even more in terms of our needs with remote learning. And I'd like to hear from people in the chat because a lot of the people in the chat, you're either teachers, you showed up to listen to this conversation, but a lot of you guys who are art prof regulars are learning with me online. So I'd love to hear from you, what helped you? in terms of formatting, in terms of platforms? What did you find helpful? How, how did we make online learning really work? Because I think the issue right now, one of the reasons teachers are so miserable is because they thought that they were gonna get apples and we said, sorry, you have oranges. And now they're like so upset that they can't make apple pie anymore. And I'm like, sorry, you just can't anymore. It's just really, really challenging. So Megan, because you didn't have a huge amount of support as a studio teacher, how did you go about getting information? Did you have colleagues? Did you go on Facebook? How did you find information? Yeah. Um, I, let's see. I mean, we, one thing I, I would say about my school is that they did do um, a really excellent job in providing a lot of resources over the summer to talk about like the broader um, issues of online teaching and, and the sort of like conceptual approach to the class or how to how to structure your syllabus in a way that wouldn't feel um, like you're just trying to recreate face to face. So it was really the the technology side um, that that I had to kind of investigate on my own. There were a couple of colleagues in my department who were also interested in um, streaming on YouTube um, using OBS. And so we helped each other out a little bit. But primarily it was um, like the Facebook groups and um, following along with the art prof videos as you made them um, that kind of addressed different technical challenges was really useful. I mean, I literally took the, you know, the, the, the list that you put with like, buy this camera, buy this thing, you know, and like copied that over. And of course they were all like not available, but found the closest <laughs> thing and, that was so, so useful, but it really did um, require taking that up as my summer project. And Jason, what was the challenge in terms of finding the information? Because the issue is that there is good information out there, but it's hard to find. So what was your experience with that? Just tracking down the right information? Uh, I would say it's very similar to, to Megan's path. Uh, I, 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 I felt like I recognized immediately that this was not going to go away. Um, this was going to persist in the fall, even though a lot of people were saying it's it's going to get better and we'll, you know, and I, I was just, I was determined based on the, the stress and everything that happened with converting to online in the middle of the semester that I was going to create classes that could work online totally. So I, you know, I, I, I did scour the Facebook groups and um, fortunately, I'm not sure, but when, but I had bookmarked uh, Art Prof uh, some several months before all of this happened. I just recognized it as a good source. Um, and uh, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll get back to that someday. And then it, you know, it came full circle that you had put together all this information. And I think I've watched all of those videos on online learning and everything. Um, I've watched all of them once and most of them, parts of them two and three times because I learned new things every time. Um, and I did the same thing. I made that list of equipment. I sent that to my IT guy and uh, uh, and then just set, set out for the summer to figure out how all this was going to work. 
It's a lot of information to process and people did not have lead time. I mean, I tell all the teachers that I'm training, listen, I had a six year <laughs> head start on you guys. And I love this comment from Blue Will Spirit who says your method works. It's been tried, tested and tweaked over time. And those three words are important. Tried, tested and tweaked. And the thing is, there's no time for you guys to do the testing period. You're just going right in with the students. I mean, you guys probably had like, what, the summer to prepare? And that is so little compared to the time because so much of online teaching I've seen, you just gotta try it, see if it works. If it doesn't, you do something else, but it takes time to do that. That is not easy for people to do. Dusty is saying, I basically never imagined I would find an art resource as accessible and as online as ArtProf. No school would ever come up with a solution like yours. Well, we're lucky and that if we feel like doing something, we just do it. Like I don't need to get anybody's permission. Whereas, you know, like the bureaucracy of doing things at a school is very challenging. And I think the issue, and Megan, you can tell me if this is true, like at least at RISD, there were no rules. And so it got even more chaotic. But then when people try to tell you what to do, it's almost more frustrating. I don't know, Megan, what do you think? Um, yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, we, we don't have um, really hard and fast regulations right now on, on what we can and can't use. And so it is it does feel a little bit like there are a million options out there. And unless you've had time to test them all yourself, you really need some source of information that you can rely on to, to help narrow it down a little bit. I mean, even I, I wouldn't have known the difference, really the differences between Discord and Slack um, without learning from people in the Art Prof Discord and people um, on the Facebook groups who ha who have pointed out the differences. Um, and I probably would have just used Slack. And I'm really glad that I didn't, um, just for some really like, pretty simple reasons, but yeah. Yeah, that's the issue is if you don't know what Slack does and you've never used it, how would you possibly understand the yeah. difference between that and Discord? So Jason, how have you been able to sort out what's good information and what is actually not helpful at all? Because it, it's hard when I go into these Facebook groups and people are making recommendations and I'm like, oh no, they obviously don't understand the bigger picture. So how, how are you able to distinguish between what's helpful and what's not? Hmm. I mean, uh, part of it is just, uh, you know, I have been teaching for a really long time. I I feel like I've got at least a, a good basis of what is effective teaching. And even though I, I totally agree with you, it's apples and oranges, but there, there are certain things that cross over that understanding um, and, uh, uh, and I think my experience just in that very short time in, in, uh, you know, March and April and May and finding your videos, it just, it came together as, as what you were saying was like exactly what I experienced. Um, I tried to make my own videos and the, it was, I spent ridiculous amounts of time trying to do that, uh, and I recognized, you know, once I learned about viewership habits of young people, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the right thing um, at all. And I've had students tell me, I've asked them, you know, do you like the live stream or what if we were all together and crowded around an easel? And the ones who answer say, no, no, this is much better. It's I, we can all get the same view and nobody's stuck in the back and it works better. So. So yeah, I, I, what you say just made sense based on my experience. So Josh is saying, I'm using Discord and OBS YouTube for my class this semester, basically following the structure you provided. My college has provided almost zero relevant info for running online art demos. I mean, I'll tell you, I feel like it's the wild west. It's like, we're all out here going, what? Like, it's really, really confusing. And I mean, teaching is already hard enough as it is. Like <laughs> having all this stuff on top of it is really, really hard. So Dusty is saying, I'm in game design. I'm assuming you're a student. 
some of our professors were trying to screen share videos on Zoom and it was atrocious. This is something I've been telling people not to do because the connection for some students is so bad that you end up just not being able to watch the video and then it's a waste of everybody's time. So really tough. And I like this comment from Kaylin who says, demos help doesn't need to be as high quality as art prof, but just explaining it, especially with art, just isn't enough for me to not be confused. So this is something that I definitely went through. When I started my YouTube channel, I said, everything's gonna be edited and perfect and just the right view and I'm gonna have multiple, like I was so ambitious about it. And we still produce tutorials like that. They just don't come out very often. Like once every few months or so, most of our content is live streaming. And Megan, I know for some teachers, a lot of them are saying, I don't like how my neck looks. What if I say the wrong word? I mean, what was your experience with that? I, I mean, I think we've all had a little um, learning curve in terms of getting used to seeing our, our faces all the time, um, you know, in little boxes while we're talking, I think. Um, for me, it just was like, well, I, I don't really worry about that when I'm in the classroom, so I'm not going to be worried about that for this. I also think um, that doing a live stream and then having that recording available for the students, because it feels so much more natural, it's not scripted, it's not um, edited, then I don't really worry about saying the wrong word or if, you know, if, if, if something doesn't work and I have to step away to like plug it back in or something, it's fine. It's just part of the the natural process. So this feels so much more natural to me than recording a video that kind of eliminates that issue for me. Now, Jason, did you ever try editing your videos or writing a script? And because I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I used to. I used to script every sentence. I edited every um and ah uh out of it. Did you ever try that or did you go right into live streaming? I, I, I did try to produce some video. I did produce some videos last uh, spring when this all first happened before I, I found uh, all of your good information. Um, but I, I just quickly realized there was no way I could edit out things. I did spend time putting you know titles in there. Um, but I, I just did not have the time uh, to even consider uh, doing that type of editing. Now, had it been not these uh, panic times, sure, I would have thought the same thing. I would have thought, let's get two camera angles going. And then, you know, I like learning new things. So it's like, okay, I'll learn how to edit all this together and make it look real slick. But there just wasn't the time to even consider it. Yeah, and what I've discovered with the pre-recorded slick videos, I've actually had people say to me, those feel cold. I was like, what? It, it looks professional to me. It looks nice and clean. And a lot of people tell me they enjoy the live streams, like you said, Megan, because of the human quality. People like the flaws. They think it's hilarious when a cat walks by in the background. So it's like that level of engagement, I think, is really important. Karen is asking, gauging student engagement during lecture must be challenging if there are many people in the class. Well, let's talk about student engagement. Megan, what's been challenging about that online? Um, I think in terms of this comment, yeah, like during a live stream, um, we Jason and I have talked about this before, just the, that um, not all live stream audiences are quite as um, participatory as the art prof ones are in terms of leaving comments or questions in the chat. So it does take a lot of prompting um, to get students to respond in the chat. Uh, I just, in terms of that kind of engagement while I'm doing a live stream, I mean, I can see how many people are on it. And that always helps me just to feel like, okay, they're there, you know, someone is there. Um, and I just try to ask specific questions that are short, um, that would have like a shorter answer. And I try to leave some time, I try to remember to leave some time to look for those questions. Um, you know, but that, that's that been, that's still a learning process for me. I'm still trying to figure that part out. Engagement on this is a whole other, a whole other thing. I mean, that's been great. Oh, actually we do have a comment here from Seven Angelic who has, having our support group for one another on Discord is great too, like having our classmates there. Yeah, one mistake that I made in the spring when I was at RISD 
is I hadn't used Discord at that point. And so I had an Instagram chat and it was okay, but there wasn't a lot of student to student interaction. It was mostly them talking to me. And so much of being in a class is engaging with your peers. So Jason, how have you tried to facilitate that student to student relationship? Um, well, one way on Discord is uh, posting, uh, have them post thumbnails or in progress work um, on there. And it's just part of the requirement that they, they at least comment on each other's work. Um, I tried the, uh, the, the social channels, um, but uh, and, and another thing Megan and I have talked about, they just really haven't bitten on there. It's me posting stuff in there. Um, and, and, you know, one or two students will playfully uh, throw something in, but they really aren't interested in that at all. Um, but trying to really emphasize the critiquing each other's artwork. And I, you know, I, I took a, um, a play from Megan and started annotating on the drawings and then reposting them. Um, and I had a student uh, who say they didn't like that because they did most of their discord on their phone and they couldn't see my handwritten comments. So I started typing them on there, but it's still just as uh, effective. Um, that's, uh, I feel like the engagement piece is something I need a lot of work on. It's really hard. I mean, I think that there are obviously a million challenges, but that I think is one of the top ones because the thing is you can control your engagement with them but you can't really control how they engage with each other and honestly you young people you guys speak another language like i feel like i'm speaking russian half the time and they're speaking like french it's just very very confusing so let's take a look at this image because jason you brought up this idea of maybe drawing digitally over pieces and then typing things. And Megan, this is one that you actually did. So can you tell us about this process and how that went? Yeah, I, I also have these work in progress channels for every different assignment or concept that we do. And, um, and the students have been really active on those. Uh, and at first I was just typing a comment in reply and trying to describe what I was, um, what I was suggesting that they do. And then I realized, oh, I can just drag this image that they shared onto my um, desktop or in my iPad, I can save it to my photos and then I can just annotate it. And that that would be so much faster and so much more, you know, I can draw on top of it. I can circle things and put arrows and, and then I'll also usually add a few typed comments um, underneath, but that has been, really, I think, effective. I mean, I in my polling of the students, they say that it's it's very helpful to have that. Um, so that's something I might, I don't know, I don't know how to continue doing that, actually, if they're not submitting their work digitally, but I wish I could continue it because it's really, um, it's been, it's fun too. It's fun to sit down and just kind of look at a bunch of drawings and leave some notes and well, and also I have this personal policy that I don't draw on student drawings in real life. Yes. And sometimes you really do want to, yes. but I just don't want to because I feel like it's an invasion of their work. But it's like here you can because it's digital. You're not messing up anybody's drawing. So it's yeah. actually sort of a perfect combination when you think about it. Darwin is saying, as a student for me, the struggle has been with hybrid courses the most. It feels like it's been a mess. Now, Jason, I think you are doing some hybrid courses, right? I am. Um, I'm teaching two courses right now. Both are hybrid. Um, uh, so we we meet roughly half the uh, the class meetings uh, as a live stream and and half of them uh, in person, but we're meeting outside. Um, and uh, so to me, I think it's working well. The 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 part that I miss uh, the most, at least, is sort of what I refer to as as coaching when it comes to uh, drawing so I can like be right over their shoulder and say, look at this, look at this. Um, we can do a little bit of that outside, but not as much as usual. Right. It's a challenge because people, I think, almost feel spread too thin. You, you almost sort of wish to be all online at that point. If anything, just to consolidate the information. 
Dara is saying my online art program was co conducted primarily through forum posts and written instructions for demos. I think it suffered from lack of real time face to face interaction. Now, I know there's a lot of debate about asynchronous, synchronous, and I know both of you do a little bit of synchronous, a little bit of asynchronous. Megan, between the two, what are the advantages or disadvantages? And do you have a preference between asynchronous and synchronous? I think um, I think that there are some real advantages to synchronous if you can do it because um, you do get that real time check in. Um, but whether that needs to be in the full group versus in smaller groups versus one on one scheduled meetings that you make, um, I'm still kind of up in the air on that. I mean, I have students in multiple time zones. And so for them, it's, I know, a real challenge to figure out their schedules in terms of synchronous. So I try to give them a lot of notice. Um, I actually planned all the synchronous group meetings in advance for the entire module that we're on. Um, the advantage of asynchronous is that they can rewatch, they can watch on their own schedule. And frankly, I don't know. I think there's this assumption that we always need to have their videos on, uh, you know, everyone's video on. And you've talked about this a lot. And um, that is so uncomfortable for so many students. And sometimes technologically or just bandwidth wise, it's not even possible. And so relying on face to face big group meetings with everyone having their video on, um, to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the students respond really positively to let's say um, breakout rooms or small group Zoom channels or uh, Discord channels where they can interact in a smaller group with each other. I think that's a little, that's been a little more effective in my experience. Yeah, I mean, student, student privacy is a big concern for a lot of people. And I, I understand why people might wanna have the students on video because if it's a student you've never met before, in person. You, you do want to know what they look like, right? The spring was a little bit different because I'd spent five weeks with them in person and I knew them, but in the fall you're getting students you'd never met before. But like you're saying, Megan, having people on video all the time, it's very uncomfortable. And tell me in the chat, those of you who are students, what do you think about this requirement to be on video all the time? Does it bother you? Do you not mind? What is your take on that? So Jason, how have you dealt with student privacy? Because I know that some students really don't want people to know about their life on Facebook or what does their Instagram feed look like? Like, how do you deal with that? Um, I made it explicit in my, uh, my syllabus that I would never require them to be on camera and, and wrote why that because of privacy and because of all of these issues. Now I, I do have that added part where we are meeting in person, um, but uh, we're also required on campus, even if we're outside, to wear a mask. So I have never really seen their faces, um, but we are at least meeting in person. So uh, I just tell them I don't, you know, I will require them occasionally to use the voice channel, but no video is ever required at all. Yeah, and I've actually had teachers say to me, I want to watch the students in a Zoom call drawing, and I want to put their phone so I can see their hand moving as they draw. I'll tell you, I got a focus group at Art Prof with college and high school students, and they do not hold back when they tell me about what they don't like. And there's so many problems because we all know how hard it is to get a good camera angle. And the students told me they felt like it was like Big Brother, like they were under surveillance by the teacher. They were just so deeply uncomfortable with it that I, I think that maybe my solution would be to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each student with the video on. So I'm just looking at them. Because honestly, when we have these group calls, I look at myself. It's not because I love the way I look. I just can't help it. Like just what I end up doing. So I just think it's, it's a lot of work that is really, really difficult. Rachel says, I don't mind being on video at all. I'm always seeking validation from teachers. So I like nodding all the time, but it can get frustrating when you don't have privacy in your home. Mariabelle says, I don't really care about showing my face, but some teachers act like if you don't show your face, you're skipping class and they threaten to report you. Yeah, that's very harsh. 
AJ says, I hate that. My journalism teacher really only makes us do cameras because we are doing engaging activities, like put a finger down or thumbs up or thumbs down. It's fun. And Emma says, my classes do not have to be on video. I'm very glad for this because I find it disorienting and stressful. I feel bad for the teachers, though. You should feel bad for all the teachers right now. I mean, they're working so hard, you guys, and really having a tough time because they're just not getting a lot of support right now. So it's very hard. Yuki says, being on video really bothers me for some reason. It feels like an evasion of my personal space, whereas being in class, you're in a different place and it feels less weird. But Mary Abel says, honestly, I understand why teachers want it on. Sometimes it's uncomfortable for a teacher to just look at blank screens. Well, what is that like, <laughs> Megan, to be sitting at your desk, you're looking at a blank screen? How is yeah. that different? Oh, it's totally different. I mean, I'm definitely a nodder too. I get that. I relate to that comment. And I love students who are nodders because it just gives you that little bit of validation that someone's hearing what you say. Um, but I do that. There's my setup. Um, so it's uh, it's a great setup, but it's just, it's me looking at a whole bunch of windows. And I don't know. I think I think you just adapt to it and kind of lean into the performative side of it, I guess, and then um, look forward to the times when you can have a one-on-one -on -one chat or a small group meeting or something where you can actually get that interaction. I mean, I think one thing that does help is when you have a lively chat, and I'm very lucky. <laughs> we have a super lively chat. We have a pre-stream party. We have a post-stream party, but you guys don't have the numbers that we have. So that I think is very, very tricky. Jason, what is that like? Because you have a whole studio set up, which I'll show in a minute, but is it weird to be in that room by yourself without all those students? Uh, yeah, it's not as weird as I had originally imagined it uh, being. Um, so, uh, you know, in that respect, I feel pretty good about it. But, you know, I mean, as anybody who's done this for a while, you start to you realize how much you feed on what's happening in the room. And that's where I would get my uh, student engagement, even when I'm giving a demo or a lecture or whatever it is, um, reading uh, eyes um, or body posture or something like that, that gives me those small interactions that are something, it brings something up that I can then um, turn into a question or another conversation, which that's completely gone. So um, I miss that, um, yeah. And Megan, let's talk a little bit about platforms because assuming you're at a college or school that doesn't have restrictions, that's not saying you must use Blackboard or whatever, there's so many options. So how did you whittle it down to what you're using and what are you using right now? Um, I'm using a combination of um, Discord and Google Drive and then YouTube um, with OBS for um, creating demos and doing my PowerPoints and all that stuff. Um, and the, I guess the reason that I chose those um, was because I knew from the spring that I wanted a space that felt more like a space. Uh, Moodle doesn't feel like a space to me. It, everything is like 15 clicks away from everything else. And it's just um, very disorienting. And so I, I originally was thinking I'll use Slack because I had used that before. Um, but I honestly, the main reason I chose Discord was the number of people you could have in a video call um, at once is higher. And and this this might sound really small, but the ability to make categories for your channels that are collapsible. Because at least when I was researching it, um, you couldn't do that on Slack without a paid subscription. And the number of channels that I now have, like doing one for every project and every student and so on, um, it's been so helpful to be able to keep them in categories and for everyone to be able to collapse them. So I wanted to use Discord because I felt like I could make it feel like an actual space. And the students have responded really, really positively to that. Yeah, and as you guys know, Art Prof has a Discord. And if you're a teacher, we have channels for educators 
that I'm in there all the time providing support, answering questions and everything. And of course we have so many other channels for a million other things. And so for us, it's just been huge in terms of really unifying our community. And Jason, I know you're using Discord. What has Discord been like for you? Uh, I think it's been great. Um, I have, I've loved Discord, um, being, uh, as Megan said, being able to organize things on there. Um, it's so easy to upload images um, or links to something. Um, the, the, uh, the course management system that my school uses, uh, it, I mean, it literally, I should count, it takes like 20 some clicks just to put a, a link to a video or a website on there. So as a result, it just, you know, unless it's something really essential for the course, I don't do it. In here, if I'm just surfing around doing something, I come across something and it's just boom, it's 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 in there. Um, the students have also told me they uh, love using Discord. Mostly the ones I've had conversations with are ones who have used it before because they're into gaming or something. Um, I had one student who told me he, when I sent the email that we were going to be on Discord, he was so excited about <laughs> being on there. Um, the uh, One of the things that I have noticed that, I mean, again, everything has flowed from exactly what Clara said. She's like, Mm -hmm. telling, you know, she's, she's telling the truth uh, all the time about everything that's happening on here is the students will respond to a direct message. So, most of them within an hour, you know, you do an email, you're lucky if you get a response three days later. A if, month. If, or, or, or ever. Uh, so that's been, I mean, even students who uh, uh, maybe aren't doing so well, and that's why you sent them a direct message, they get right back to me, like within an hour. Oh, sorry, I'll get on that. That would never happen with email. So, Discord uh, is. Um, I will certainly be using Discord uh, probably for all my classes going forward. Um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a great platform. And the actually the way I met Megan and Jay, well, Matt <laughs> virtually, is through the Art Prof Discord because you guys did join the many educate, well, we really only have one that we use a lot, the educators channel, and we've all been connecting and talking. How has that been for you in terms of peer support, watching other teachers and being able to ask questions in there? I, I It's been great for me. Um, I remember in the, towards the end of the summer, there were a few of us who were well, Discord just released an update and it looks like now you can switch roles um, and actually see what things look like from a student role, which is huge. But in the summer, you couldn't do that. And so we had we were like joining each other's class servers as students to help each other um, with permissions and making sure that we could see things the way that we wanted them to be seen. Um, just incredibly helpful people and really generous. Yeah, and I know it's been hard because with teachers, it's like you don't see each other in the faculty lounge anymore and you don't have that connection. Jason, have you been able to connect with other faculty at your school or other schools? What's that been like? Um, I, I, I've talked a little bit to some of my, my friends here, um, but... Um, we're a tiny school, so there really aren't, there's only a couple of other art professors, uh, and we one of them actually uh, uh, decided to quit rather than tackle all of this. Um, and the so it's it's been difficult to find that community, and uh, the art prof uh, discord has been invaluable to be able to just pop on there, ask a question, um, hopefully take some time to answer somebody else's question too. Um, it's, it's been a great, great resource for, for, for me being in a, a very remote place with not many other uh, art teachers. So we have two basic questions for both Megan and Terry. Megan, you can go first. Life Artiste is saying, what grade do you teach? And Raindrops is saying, did all of you guys go to art school? So Megan, let's start with you. Oh, so I teach, um, I teach college and I, so I teach all, um, levels of drawing and also illustration. And I, um, I went to Brown university for my undergrad. So that's like a research university. And then I did go to art school, Minneapolis college of art and design for my MFA. 
And Jason, what are you teaching at Northland College? Um, I'm right this semester. I'm teaching uh, drawing one and drawing two. Um, it's all college level. Um, I also teach uh, all levels of uh, printmaking and basic 2D design and um, senior seminar. And uh, I also teach a class in outdoor ephemeral installation, um, among a few other things that come up occasionally. And I went to uh, I went to large state universities. I went to the University of uh, Wisconsin and Madison for undergraduate, and the University of Tennessee, uh, Knoxville, for my uh, graduate. Uh, work. Cool. Let's talk about equipment. <laughs> of course, this is so hard for people. And honestly, people have no idea how hard it is. Getting the right camera angle is so hard. And if you don't have the right equipment, I actually have a list of equipment that says don't use this stuff, because it's going to drive you up the wall. So Megan, in terms of getting equipment, what was the most essential piece of equipment that really made a big difference because I feel terrible that teachers are buying stuff out of their own pocket because the schools are not providing budget. And so if you're a teacher and you, you could buy like one thing, what would it be? Ooh, um, that's a tough, that's tough because I feel like there are so many moving parts to this. Like the, the, the thing that I guess surprised me the most that turned out to be really necessary was, was lighting. I thought, this is a, a shot of my office. I have really good lighting in there. What I thought was awesome lighting. And it turns out that for a demo, um, I actually have to like close my shades, turn off certain lights, turn on those angled lights, dim them. Like the the issue with drawing on white paper and blasting out the, the image while you're working on it. So to me, I think having the, having at least a light that you can adjust um, that, that, that seems pretty essential if you're going to do a demo, at least with drawing, it might be different with painting or something with less, um, less negative space. And Jason, in terms of the physical setup, it seems like you've got a pretty streamlined version now, but what was the hardest thing for you? Was it the lighting? Was it the camera angle? What was the thing that was tough? Um, for me, it's, it really is the lighting. It still continues. Um, uh, as I, I mean, one thing that I did differ uh, from your original setup is you, um, you were still drawing large, the 18 by 24 pad, and you were scooting back. And um, I decided to go smaller with uh, uh, 11 by 14 as our drawing pad size. So the, the cameras are, they have a hard time picking up kind of small pencil work. So that's that's been challenging. I, I guess my biggest challenge is as as we were doing in the uh, setup just for this live stream is my lighting is still not quite optimal. Um, 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 yeah, so I'm still working on some of the troubleshooting with that. I may end up having to get uh, a dimmable light because I because of my I'm using a monitor that's huge. So the light if I move it too far away, then I get it's uh, my monitors blocking the light. So I'm still working on figuring that out. Like somebody said earlier in the stream, test tweak, you know, like I definitely have some streams where you can see my head because like I leaned too far forward. And then eventually you can see this in Jason's photo here that there is this mic stand that I have recommended people to buy. And that was a total game changer because once I had the mic stand, it was like no problem because I can actually set myself up now to the point that I actually can lean super far forward, but my head will never show. So it's, it's like a nice fail safe that I have built in. And if any of you guys want to see the equipment that I recommend, this is the stuff that's on the teaching and learning art online page on artprof.org. And this is a list of stuff to avoid for many, many different reasons. So you guys can go check that out. We have some questions from some students. Rachel saying, if you use Discord, do you require them to change their nicknames? That would be really sad. Megan, what did you do in terms of that? Because you can't always tell who it is. They've got different names. Yeah, I did, um, I did ask them to make sure that their first name was included in their nickname. Um, I also asked them to include their pronouns um, because that's something that my college is pretty proactive about asking everyone to um, kind of present upfront. 
So I did do that. Um, I did, I specifically for those that weren't on Discord to begin with though, which was most, most of my students had not used it. Um, I did recommend that they not have their real name in their username um, and that they just change their nickname in our server um, just so that we would kind of know who each other were. We have a question from Amaris who's saying, how can I make an outline of the course? I have autism and ADD, but I'm very organized. How can I make it work to my advantage for planning it out? Do you have any thoughts on that, Jason? Because it is challenging. Every student has different needs. And how do you deal with that online? Um, at, at least in this time, I have uh, I've tried to be extremely flexible in terms of 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 deadlines and when things when they have to turn things in. I uh, I didn't make it explicit, but in practice, I don't even take attendance. Um, these are all things that in my uh, Pre-COVID times, I had uh, hard and fast policies on, um, but I in this time I'm just trying to be as flexible as possible for them um, because they can watch the live streams later. They can re-watch them. Um, I give grace periods for turning things in, um, so hopefully that is helping some. the The students did receive a. Uh, a complete outline and a complete list of everything we were doing each day. Um, they received that on day one. And um, I've been able to follow that almost to a T. So if they're organized, they should be able to plan some of that stuff out. Cool. All right. Well, you guys are pretty seasoned at this point because I definitely have watched your live streams and wow, it's a ton of work. But I'll tell you guys, everybody who's watching right now, the thing about online learning, you have to do a lot of work in the beginning. But Megan, do you feel like you're starting to get into the groove at this point? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, we, Jason and I both have also this additional situation in which we're in these compressed um, semesters right now. Our schools have, have kind of altered the academic calendar because of COVID. So we're actually almost done with the drawing one class, um, even though it's really only midterm time. And I feel like totally um, the I have a kind of a groove figured out for the live streams for sure. I think the biggest thing I'm learning over the course of this session is to simplify things even more than you think are already simplified down to like how many channels are in discord i mean i've had so many comments from students that are like it's too much it's too confusing i can't there's too many channels and i think i thought it was it would be helpful to have all of these different places to go for information but there's so much screen fatigue and there's so much just sense of like being scatterbrained and kind of overwhelmed i think getting as I'm preparing for the next one, which starts in like a couple weeks, um, I'm going to simplify my Discord server way more. And Jason, if you were to give piece of overall advice, not the nitty gritty, but just in general, to somebody who's really struggling right now to teach online, what would you say to them? Um, that, you know, mistakes are going to happen. Things are going to go haywire. Um, I think Megan's advice of, of simplify as much as you can. I, I, I came to the same conclusion. My, my Discord server probably could be, I could cut out a half dozen or a dozen channels uh, and it would work just fine. Um, I think uh, uh, probably the biggest thing is have it, have a solid plan written down that the students also have, but be willing to change that when it does not work. Um, I, I found a few times because of the haste that I put things together, I had conflicting uh, dates, due dates for things. Um, and that causes panic in students always. And so I, you know, and this has nothing to do with this, but I always say, if I ever contradict myself in dates or times, always take the later one because I would, I would never move something up on you with unexpectedly. So um, That's organize, great. Yeah, organize, but be flexible when things don't work out. And, you know. I think a lot of us 
at least for me, that's what I would miss is the spontaneity that you can have in a brick and mortar classroom because sometimes I'm teaching something. I'm like, oh man, the students are not getting it. They need a demo right now. And I can just be like, come over here, I'll show you. Yes. But you can't do that online. <laughs> like if you don't have the camera set up and all your stuff ready to go, it's just totally impossible. So we have a question here from AJ. Could we watch their streams, Megan and Jason, pretend we're in the class asking because I only have one art class this year and I miss having multiple teachers. So Megan and Jason, I'm gonna get to you guys in a minute, but I know that this is a big concern for schools because the thing is if you enroll at a college and you're paying tuition, it's not cool for people who are not paying tuition to have access to that content. Now that said though, Privacy is something schools are really stressed out about in terms of content and what gets shared. So Megan, how has your school dealt with that? Oh yeah, so we we um, were, rec if we were recording anything that would communicate any um, information about a student name or their image in a video, we had to include a disclosure in our syllabus um, that that the students could like opt into um, giving permission for that. What I've done to get around that is um, all of my YouTube streams are unlisted, but also um, I try, I don't allow the live chat to replay. So because their names will come up in the live chat or their YouTube usernames will come up. So I don't allow the live chat to replay. And then what, what I will do at the end of the term is just um, edit out the very beginning of the stream where I might mention things that are really specific to that group or class. Um, because I have thought, you know, I would love to be able to use these videos again in the future if, if a student had a question or missed a class or something. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that if there was any way that any like FERPA protected information was coming across in that stream. So I don't think it would be possible to open them up for other people to watch. And Jason, how have you dealt with that issue of privacy and access to the content? Um, exactly the same way Megan is. Uh, they're unlisted and I don't allow the chat to replay. Um, so those names won't be there. Um, I have even... I, I don't always mention their names when um, I go through the, the questions uh, that might come up. Um, uh, I think I, I sort of flip back and forth from that because I'm getting to know them now. So it seems odd not to use their names. And, I, and as you've told us, Clara, that people like to hear their name on, um, on a YouTube thing. So I'm not only using a first name. I was going to research and find out, is that a potential FERPA violation? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty much the same thing Megan's doing. I just, there's made a it. lot of confusion. Yeah. yeah. With, with the FERPA and then what's, because nobody knows what they're doing. It's totally new uncharted territory. And we're all making this up as we go along. That's what's so hard about it. So Megan, I know that a lot of people are struggling right now, teachers and students, None of this is easy at all, but where's the silver lining? Because I know for me, if I was teaching the semester, I'm not teaching very much the semester, but I can't go forever being upset that I'm not in a brick and mortar classroom because it doesn't seem like that's happening anytime soon. So how do you keep from being endlessly frustrated because you're not in the classroom? And also where's the silver lining? I mean, it's a work in progress and it depends on the week, uh, honestly, but I I guess there are a few silver linings for me. One is um, trying like a present moment silver lining is that I feel like if you focus really, really intentionally on co creating community in your online class, that that community can be a silver lining for everybody in the class. Like I've I've heard from students how much they appreciate the sense of community that we have, even though I don't maybe think, you know, they're using the social channels like as much as I would like or something like that. Like for them, it's really becoming a space that's bringing them some joy and bringing them some, you know, meaningful engagement right now. Um, in terms of a long-term silver lining, I mean, I, 
I like learning new things. So I, that's engaging to me. And, and I do feel like down the road, these skills will be useful for things like um, accessibility for classes, you know, having the ability to record a video, maybe intentionally record it later, um, video demos that can be there as a backup for students who need to see the material multiple times or who need to um, be able to review it. That's a big silver lining, something that I've always kind of intended to do, but never had the time, never had the, you know, never made the time to do it. Um, so that that's one. Jason, where are the silver linings for you in this whole experience? Um, well, uh, uh, my uh, my drawing classes are going outside and engaging with our campus. Um, that has been something that I've wanted to do for a long time, but uh, for a whole lot of reasons, it just never did happen. It was just always easier to do uh, to do the studio. Um, drawing class, but so I've, I've taken the time to make that work and I've come up with a few ideas that I think work well. So I'm gonna probably keep doing those. Um, as Megan said, having those videos, I hope that they're still usable um, for students who miss or need to see something. My school gets a lot of uh, students who have uh, various learning issues um, and sometimes just seeing that one demo and that's it and then they get a one page description of what they're supposed to be doing is just not enough for them to, to do that. So I, I'm, I'm hoping those videos are gonna be usable, um, but I, I now know it's not even that hard to make a new one and uh, that would cut out all the other information because I swear 10 minutes of my live streams are giving reminders and of things and then I realize, well, that's not gonna be good yeah. next year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> telling them what we're doing tomorrow, which may not be uh, valid information. Um, I think I think Discord. I'm gonna think I'm going to carry Discord forward in some capacity, no matter what format I'm teaching in, um, and specifically trying to create that more of a community outside of the classroom, um, even if it's just a few channels to show things. Um, I, I will probably carry that forward too. Right. I mean, I can't imagine that teachers are going to go back to the brick and mortar classroom and not take something from this experience. I mean, I would never have met you guys. Like what reason would I have ever connected with you unless we like met at some conference in Alaska that, you know, 20 people are going to in academia. Maybe I would have met you then, but it's like, I see people making connections in the Facebook groups, helping each other out. And that to me is extraordinary because most teachers, we don't make time for that because we're so busy with a million other things. And I just feel like one thing about online teaching, I just feel like my world is bigger. I just have learned from so many different places and that would never have happened if I had just stayed in Providence. Our Prof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And we hope that you guys will join us in the Artcroft Discord. We will be hanging out in the post live streams channel. The invite link is in the video description below. And Megan and Jason, if you guys are around, we would love to have you guys chat with us for a few minutes over there as well. Subscribe to our channel and join the Artcroft family. And we want to give a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible. So helpful to have you guys who are students and teachers in the chat contribute to this discussion. Thank you so much for that. I want to say thank you to Megan and to Jason for coming on to the stream and having this discussion. So helpful. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>